Uh, thank you very much for making the time, those who are in the room today with us, but also those who are online. Um, today, very privileged to have with us uh, Anne Fleming uh, from ACIR, um, which is uh, one of our closest partners for Worldfish, but also and uh, I think many describe her as a good friend of World Fish as well. So thank you, Anne, for making the effort and time to come and see us here uh, in Penang. Um, so for those who are here in the room with us and those who are watching us online, uh, wonderful that you're here. But for those who are not, we are also recording this session and we'll make it available to our colleagues as well, either via MS Teams or other platforms. Anne, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Yesim, and thank you for the warm welcome. It's lovely to be back at World Fish. It's been about five years, I think, and, yeah, it's always nice to come back and have a warm reception. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about ACR, so I'm not really going to focus so much on the fisheries program as such, but rather talk about some uh, exciting new initiatives to better deliver, deliver actionable research for policy and practice change. And... All, all day today I've been talking about this um, this need for us to be much more cognizant of how we position our science so that we are partnering with stakeholders to to ensure that it's presented in a way that in, that leads to uptake and change and it's an area where ACR is really working to strengthen their capability in that area so uh, I don't know that I have to explain what ACR is to most people here, um, but just quickly go through and remind you that it's part of the Australian government's aid program. We're an independent organisation. We do research for development and we're a, a funder, but we're not a granting body. We commission research, so we commission our partner agencies, mostly Australian research providers, but international providers like World Fish, to deliver um, research by through partnerships with uh, like uh, sector research providers in country. Uh, not only have we got a strong focus on research for development, but we also have a very significant capability in capacity building. So we've got a dedicated capacity building and outreach program that uh, focuses on traditionally, traditionally scholarship programs, which have been very influential. We've got alumni throughout our partner countries, and now they're senior in government and really advocates for ACR. And um, that's been a really strong component of our work and we're broadening that, that work to include much more diverse capacity building programs. Uh, this is, um, again, just a quick overview of uh, the structure of ACR. So up the top it shows you the, the um, research programs that we have, agribusness, crops, there's their IAM in fisheries. So uh, we've got 10 now programs. Most of them are sector-based, but we've got some of those cross-cutting uh, thematic approaches such as water and climate. Those programs each run their own um, portfolio of investments. So I, I, I run the fisheries portfolio investments. And so each program is responsible for delivering against our higher arching objectives. Three of those are traditional development objectives, as you see there, and three are more enabling cross-cutting um, thematics that's, that support and enhance the delivery of those development objectives. Uh, now, I'm going to just give you a little bit of background. In recent times, since I was here five years ago, we have a new government in Australia and a new Minister of um, uh, Foreign Affairs, and we have a much greater um, recognition of our value in the aid program with our new minister. And we have, she's visited ACR House and, and talked to various people around the building. And, um, and it's been a, a really nice uh, refresh of ACR's um, perspective within government. And again, we're seeing less on defence and more on science as soft diplomacy, which we've always advocated for, that that is a very significant part of what ACR does. This is in terms of how we frame ourselves politically, is that we can do much around um, uh, 
regional security and and diplomacy in that field. And as a result, we've maintained our budget over the years. We haven't decreased, which is a positive in our view, like many other agencies in Australia. So. Um, our, our budget is modest. It has reduced over the last 10 year period, but in uh, the time I've been there in five years, it's maintained. And so in the context of how we design our strategy, we, we um, are very cognizant of the emerging geopolitical hotspots in the region. So PNG is very significant for us, particularly the, the strip of land that intersects between PNG and Australia in the Torres Strait. Um, Bougainville has recently gained its independence and um, is look, uh, perhaps heading for a, a, a bit of a rapid time of change and therefore uh, risk associated with that. Timor-Leste, as, as World Fish would be aware, um, is heading for a fiscal cliff in the next 10 years and Australia is very concerned about the um, regional security in the area because of that, that risk to economy. And Solomon Islands, as you're all aware, has been under a um, significant um, flux and change and, and um, civil disruption, which is of concern to Australia. So this is just a segue slide to, tell, to, to indicate that now I'm going to talk about these programs that um, ACR has engaged with in strategic change. And this really started, I guess, at the beginning of COVID when we had time to sit and reflect on and what we're doing and where we're heading. And particularly given that we're, we're, re, we're celebrating this year our 40th anniversary. So we began in the um, 1980s, celebrating our 40th year and thinking about the next 40 years and the, the incredible challenges ahead for the globe and how ACR might need to reposition itself and reorganize itself to be fit for purpose for those challenges. So I'm gonna to touch a slide each on those four components listed there. So most people in this audience perhaps wouldn't be aware that we've, we've had a, an in-house review project, IHR uh, process, that, that um, really uh, is rigorous and, and lengthy in, in time. And traditionally we focused on the preliminary proposal. So a project leader would write a proposal and that would be taken to an in-house review through, across the RPMs. It was really um, too late, you know, too little, too late, and we really needed to bring the co-design process right up front so that we had input right at the beginning. So now we've we've thrown out I, our monthly IHR tradition, and we um, we've we uh, have ensured we have a team of co-design experts in house, but also can engage external people to really contribute to the development, conceptualisation and development of a project throughout its, its um, design stages. And uh, yeah, and lastly, that, that process really engages the project leader throughout the co-design process so that they're brought along and, and very cognizant of ACR thinking through that process and their needs. Now the other area that's that's um, just emerging, and this is a result of our mid-term review of our 10-year strategy. So in that review, we had said that we'd be shifting towards programmatic, integrated, holistic approaches, cross-disciplinary. You know, we all know these terms, but they're easier said than done, and we hadn't tackled this this aspect of the strategic plan. So. As a result, we've done a lot of internal um, discussion and thinking over the last six months, and we will now be dedicating from next concept note round in, early, in next year, 30% of our ad, annual budget to programmatic investments. And uh, we are working how to, how to do that. We're, we're really deeping, digging deeply into the literature and other examples of this sort of approach to learn from experience because it is, um, as everyone recognises, a very difficult thing to do. So we're putting a lot of focus on context analysis and, and um, assessing where we can achieve transformational sh shifts in system constraints. Uh, and I'll talk later about an example that we're starting with. We've, we've started in Timor as an, uh, a case study of how ACR might engage in that space. 
Another principle is that we'll engage uh, deeply with diverse perspectives early on in the design process. And that's not just um, disciplined perspectives, but also perspectives within the systems within a country, whether that's um, political, economic, cultural, social, environmental. Um, and so, and I, yeah, I like to frame it in that we'll, we'll, we'll be engaging both horizontally against disciplines and vertically with non-academic actors. So those end users of our research products will be engaged early in the co-design process. And yeah, I've already said case study underway in Timor and with a focus on the and trying to shift the nutritional status of food systems and food production in Timor. Now, another area that we feel like we um, need to do some some homework and to assess how you know we've inherited our thinking from our past um, model of how ACL was set up is this recognition of being able to translate our knowledge into policy and practice and, and put some more rigour into this and, and draw on the science so our, our strategies are more rigorous than they have been in the past because we recognise that it has been a bit of a, you know, um, a bit of a wing on a prayer in that we, we position our research to end users but we don't have that deep um, discipline expertise and political analysis and knowledge translation and how knowledge sh flows between different decision makers within that dis that um, stakeholder mapping scenario that, that is needed to better understand uh, the interface between science and, and adoption. So we're reviewing our approaches and we're actually bringing in a specialist to ACR. We um, we are going to have someone at a desk in ACR for a, a large proportion of the week and for the next couple of years so that we can really uh, assess what we've done in the past. So we've got some case studies already underway of what we're doing currently and how we can draw on this expertise to really build capacity within ACR and particularly the research program managers to be able to, in that new co-design process, to really bring that knowledge to our with, to our project leaders and the teams and and really flow that capacity building onto our, our project team and leaders. Um, another one is uh, gender and social inclusion. So we have just finished a three-year strategy, gender strategy. Uh, we have a gender committee at ACR. And this, at the beginning of this year, uh, I, um, with my colleague uh, Eleanor Deans, uh, co-chair the Jesse Committee, as we call it now, and we've decided that we really need to uh, engage some expertise to uh, advise us on a strategy for ACR, so that that strategy looks at institutional change, but also um, change within our partner countries and change within our research projects. So we contracted um, the Stockholm Institute, the um, uh, Envi uh, Stockholm Environment Institute, and that was led by a um, colleague, ex-colleague of yours, Cynthia McDougall. So a group of expert gender experts in the SEI have been running a um, stakeholder consultation across ACR, in country, in ACR, with our with our stakeholders as well. So that we can really have a um, a um, a voice at the table as to where we think ACI should move in that in this space. And I've already said that there's a particular focus on institutional change because we recognise that the structural barriers to gender equity and inclusion um, are really embedded with institutions, and also trying to strengthen that component of re of gender within our research projects. And within the, the the thematic, the strategic thematic within our new strategy for research, we've got a focus on um, building that that or strengthening our gender consideration. We've always had that aspect to project design, strengthening that that because we realise it's still um, not as uh, strong an element of our design as as could be, but also really engaging in gender transformative approaches. And this is something that, I, uh, that Worldfish have been in that space for some time now, 
but we have um, talked about it but not actually engaged in it um, uh, appropriately and we'd really like to have those dedicated gender projects that really understand where those transformational pieces, opportunities are within our countries. So we recognise to do that we need context-specific gender strategies. So what we're going to do is engage our country offices. We have country offices in all the uh, uh, partner countries that we engage with. So we have 10 country offices across the world and they're staffed by ACR staff. And so they're the best people to advise and, and um, co-design uh, place-based gender strategies that can inform our programs of work within those contexts. Now, this is to just segue into my what I want to talk about next, and I'll just frame it around, um, explain the passion that I have in this area because it's actually going to be part of my master's. I'm studying a master's of international development. I'm into my third year, and in third year, I have to do a little um, industry-based project. And so I am interested in how ACR might build its capabilities for working with diverse teams at the interface between science and policy. And um, so it's it's an area that um, I've just begun to delve into the literature and work with a researcher at the Australian National University to design up a little bit of research that I'll do at, at ACR and conduct some um, focus group interviews with RPMs. But first, before I get into that, I'll, this, I won't read this out because this is something I think the audience will be quite familiar with, working with complexity and the principles of process um, processes that need to be engaged to do that work. So I've been harvesting this literature, this the, these um, thematics out of the literature, which can then inform my my piece of study. So I've actually already talked about context analysis, being able to deeply understand the socio-political, socio-ecological and historical context. And of course, the way we engage is critical. So in international development, the, the plurality of modes of engagement so that we can put the, um, the decision making in the hands of our beneficiaries, co-learning, co-design, better understanding the, the research translation and evidencing that impact. And also positionality, and this is where my, my master's study comes in, um, positionality of self within the, the within the research context or the development context. And um, this audience would be familiar with these concepts of decolonising mindsets, understanding different value systems and understanding the methodological approaches required to really engage with with the um, with the other or with the with our beneficiaries. Um, so, what I have I will be doing for my masters is trying to harvest the competen competencies and dispositions required to engage in diverse teams with the aim to in, um, engage with complexity, if you will. So, the next couple of slides is about the competencies that I've I've harvested from the literature around requirements for individuals, requirements for teams, and requirements for organisations. So for individuals, the, the learning skills, so for so these are really um, dispositions um, and openness to new ways of doing and learning, resilience, perseverance through difficult situations, self-motivation, and bringing to the, the table to the team a sense of humbleness so putting ego aside essentially so these are, are ways of um of needing to engage with the fact that complex situations requires uncertainty n n being comfortable with not knowing the final outcome be comfortable with failure be comfortable with adaption and rapid adaption and and twisting as, as you learn, twisting and turning in your direction as you learn. Um, and of course, adaptation competencies, strong systems thinking, strategic thinking, critical thinking, futures thinking, and good with people. So this is probably the one where um, this these interpersonal skills that, that uh, are really come to the fore, ability to develop diverse and strong social networks, 
build mutual trust with stakeholders, strong communicator, highly collaborative. So, you know, it, it's not rocket science, these, these points. It really is quite um, obvious what it takes, but actually bringing teams together with, with diverse um, disciplines, with diverse backgrounds, diverse histories, diverse cultures to achieve um, coherence and collaboration is clearly, the, the, uh, in my view, the, the stumbling block to achieving interdisciplinary work or that, that work that really engages with knowledge translation. Um, so here's a, the repeat slide, but this time for teams. So these are competencies and features. Uh, and then this is more broadly uh, the areas that I've, I've gathered so far. This is not complete, but um, just to begin with in the design process, uh, we, early goal setting seems obvious, but often we get into a project where we know what we want to do with the research, but we're not quite clear on the end goal of that research. So it has to be strategic and ambitious. Focused on focused science on policy hotspots. So this is sort of the low hanging fruit opportunity opportunities that arise. Conduct that policy scanning early, so that that political, economic, social context. Conduct stakeholder and end use mapping early, um, and to, so we understand relationships and the knowledge flow amongst those relationships. Establish networks among team members and stakeholders co-design research questions with end users. So making sure what we do is not research driven, but early on we're engaging with our end users to make sure that um, we're, we're doing research to address problems, coming up with research that leads to solution finding. Um, and here's some more categories that, um, that sit under teams that I haven't populated yet, but they will also be, um, they are in the literature as key, evaluation, knowledge, ex knowledge exchange, project legacy, project implementation. So I just talked about the design step, but of course in the implementation step, there's a whole lot of other different com um, challenges to face. And team diversity. So um, interestingly, we think about multidisciplinary teams a bit more in the in the okay. Well, we've got a, a diverse team because we've got the technical and the social, but really um, the literature is saying we need those specialist um, uh, people that bring in knowledge brokering, social sciences, and policy analysis as well. And the last slide in this little section is institutional. So what competencies and features are required for institutions to support those teams and individuals to engage in, in these sorts of um, translation initiatives? Well, one that comes up in the literature a lot is recognition and award, because of course, particularly in academia, which a lot of these papers are, are focused within, it's about papers and um, more simplistic uh, pure science that can lead to papers. And so being able to set up systems within institutions that recognise and reward these activities and, and the impacts, not the papers, but the societal impacts is required. And we need new metrics for uh, evidencing those impacts. And of course, effective leadership needs to engage those teams and to support them and, and provide the strategic overarching higher level goals that that show the teams where their you know the mission is um, where the mission is and how they contribute to that mission um, and the organization just as the team has to be adaptive and flexible also has to be um, uh, flexible in its strategy and not locked in and it says diverse leadership should have that mix of policy and science. So there's an understanding of the of the needs of both and the and the requirements to to engage with both. Um, and a culture of experimentation, which means a, an acceptance and a reward for trialing and failing um, the lesson and extracting the lessons learnt from that that process. And also funding, it takes. 10 to five to 10 years before you actually can see impact from many um, research for uh, policy impact. So you have to be in the longer term if you're going to look to, uh, see the um, impact from that investment. And freeing up time to focus on this engagement because it is a time consuming, as you could see in those slides, the, the amount of um, 
uh, networking and, and consultation and negotiation and coming to a common understanding and, and, neg and negotiating conflict. It's a time consuming process that really doesn't. Um, uh, and again, it, it's part of that reward, uh, allowing people to spend time with those activities and accepting that that's part of the process. Um, so I'll just um, now move to um, a little bit of, uh, uh, give you an overview of the fisheries program um, for those that are, are keen to hear what we're doing in this space. And uh, first of all, I'll talk about um, the theory of change. So this is something that we were asked to do, I think it was about a year ago, might have been 18 months ago now, is to articulate our theory of change and to make sure that those high level end of program, fisheries program outcomes were, were articulated so that we could contribute, it could, it was clear how we contributed to ACR's six strategic objectives. So you can see it's there behind these blue pillars, but it's too complex and we don't need to go into that now. But I'll suffice to say that there's three um, thematics within my theory of change. The first, management of aquatic resources and ecosystems for sustainability. So that speaks to fisheries management, sustainable resource management, as well, and, and um, a significant uh, flagship program for me is our, our community-based fisheries management in the Pacific. So that's a DFAT ACR co-investment. Uh, it's been variously six to ten million per investment, and now we're into our third third phase of investment, and already talking about the next phase in five years' time. And I've been talking to some people today about where we could really look to take that investment just beyond fisheries management because it's at the scaling phase. So we really are looking for an exit strategy from that purely CBFM focus. And I'd like to take it into a more food systems, coastal food systems um, narrative in the next investment. Um, the ecosystem element of that, that um, pillar is about restoring damaged or depleted ecosystems. So we have a coral restorations in the Philippines uh, project that is now into its um, uh, 12th year perhaps, as well as fish ladder integration into rice irrigation water management infrastructure in the Mekong, which is now also in, into its 15th year. So both of those investments and beyond the technical scaling now and into the technical um, focus and now into the scaling area. So we're, we've really matured those programs over time. Uh, Pacific food systems for health, human health and nutrition. So um, that really breaks down the pillars of, of um, you know, just working in fisheries for me. I was very keen when I started to engage in food systems. And so within the program, um, I started a series of invest investments in the Pacific that really speaks to mapping food systems, uh, engaging SBC to, to uh, utilise their uh, regional data sets, integrate them so that it could be an in integration that speaks to food system uh, analysis and policy, and then engaging with policymakers at that higher level and the regional level to understand um, so that people are aware, uh, decision makers are aware of how their food systems are operating, where the opportunities are for strengthening. Um, and now we've got a, a second phase of that work that really well, it, it, it spans into East Timor, that, that piece of work, and it also drills down into food environments and understanding the significant um, value of informal food systems in the Pacific. So um, food exchange, traditional food exchange and, and simple food markets. Um, and I've got a new novel piece of research that's seeking to uh, build youth advocacy for food systems transformation in the Pacific. So uh, engaging youth to um, understand how their local food environments, whether it's at school or in the church settings or in their local townships, influence how food is purchased. So if we could shift food systems to make it easier to buy healthy foods, that would be um, a significant 
support for communities um, to understand, one, understand how their food environments influence their choices and then to make informed decisions uh, as to how uh, they could advocate for their food environments to change um, over time. And the third pillar is um, really in that traditional, how do we um, improve the efficiency of aquatic production systems? So uh, aquatic production system innovation is what that speaks to. Um, and so in the Pacific, we're, we're building a portfolio of research that, that um, is uh, engaging with integrated sea-based mariculture as a, as a, um, as a, a narrative around how food systems in the, in the coastal regions are going to have to broaden their production system to, to cope under climate change and increased population growth. And the opportunities there is by um, low trophic species, low uh, technological in, or low capital inputs, low te technological requirements, and so and nutritious species. So integrating, for instance, seaweeds, edible oysters, sea cucumbers uh, in a system that uh, so that can sit within no-take zones or, or marine conservation zones. So, um, and, and that speaks to the community-based fisheries management program of work where I'm wanting to really shift to that broader coastal food systems narrative in the Pacific. Um, so the strategy there, I think, um, yeah, I've really talked about that. So that's really, I won't go into that. That's really just summarising what I've said. And now I've just got three, I think, slides just giving you a taste. And again, I think I've talked about it in that first slide. Um, so the Pacific Food Systems work, the mapping, youth advocacy, and then the sustainable resources, scaling CBFM and the nutrition sensitive management in the Pacific in the in Timor. So just to give you a snapshot of the of the work that's that's um that's sitting within the fisheries program there. Pacific and Timor. Oh so the aquatic production system. So the fish based innovation. So that's that's our work with, with World Fish, Solomon and Timor. We've got a seaweeds livelihood project in Samoa. Um, and we'll broaden that out to um, uh, other countries soon in a new investment. Uh, we've got a little piece of work, so that is in the in the gender space under my program, is to look at diverse genders in fisheries and agriculture in Samoa, edible oysters and seaweed in, in Fiji. That's a new project under co-design at the moment. We've got a long-term project uh, in on Marbe pearls, so um, to do more to do with income for particularly women, women's groups. So they're not only growing the pearls, but also making handicrafts out of those pearls. And pending, I've got for sea cucumbers. Um, it's the holy grail. Sea cucumbers been um, of interest for decades. Farming of sea cucumbers and and very little success to date. Although I was in Vietnam um, to to review our project there, and um, so and it, they're making great inroads. So in that situation, they're growing sea cucumbers in earthen ponds. So the old shrimp ponds that are decommissioned. Now they're integrating sea cucumbers with a variety of species like the Babylonian snail or certain types of fish um, and really, and they've got their hatchery up and running and producing 100,000 juveniles a month. So, and they've got engaging um, the private sector, they're developing new innovative products. Um, uh, yeah, so I think that's on the verge of actually achieving something that hasn't been achieved in the world. My view, but yeah, I'm very. Uh, I've been I've been asked to by the Ministry in, of Fisheries in the Pacific to consider re-engaging in sea cucumbers in Fiji, and um, I'm really talking to lots of people to understand where we can do some work in that space. So it's because governance is the real issue, of course, and so whether there's some work that we could do to um, really. Uh, address the the barriers that that uh, governance um, puts on 
sea cucumber ranching in the Pacific is something I'm interested in. And uh, the Mekong, I've touched on this as well. So we've had that scaling, um, uh, we're, we're into that scaling of fish ladder technology. Um, I haven't talked about that second point about um, a uh, similar sort of thing, but on the huge main uh, main stem hydroelectric dam. So we've got a project that engages with a private company in Laos. Uh, there was a um, $300 million fish ladder put into a $3 billion hydroelectric dam. We didn't design it, but we were asked to partner with a company to assess how effective it is passing fish. And then the idea was that that would be then the government would set that as a gold standard if it proved to be um, effective. And early data, it, it was all held up by COVID, but early data suggests that, yes, it is an actually a, a good design for allowing a high proportion of a wide range of species to pass through the dam. But interestingly, our, our theory of change around influence is, hasn't held out. And and partly because we haven't generated the data yet, but also we're realising that uh, the political situation is such and the economic, the dire economic situation is such post-COVID that there's a lot of drivers for revenue generating that mean that these these large projects are, are going ahead at any cost. And, and we've decided actually that it's probably not the right policy environment for influencing, but we should be there for the long term because eventually we um, our work will be, you know, people will turn to our work because they'll be wanting answers. Um, and that one within Asterix is the one that's we um, we've we've partnered with World Fish in the past. It's not um, work that we've continued as yet, but very keen to re-engage in the in the deltas of um, the Mekong. And so we've had a really nice historic program of work in um, in Myanmar um, on that that field. And PNG uh, scaling inland tilapia. So. Um, been very successful. They, they talk about there being 60,000 farms now through the highlands of PNG. And of course, for people that have got a significant protein deficiency, that's been a really um, influential project for ACR. Um, and now we've got a piece of work that's focused in the Western Province. So Western Province has got very little uh, state um, uh, servicing. They've, they've got very little development servicing actually over the years. So uh, very low um, level. Uh, their poverty status is is one of the worst in the world, and so ACR is doing some really nice social science foundational work to understand how we can build on um, local livelihoods and traditional ways of, of of food production and to strengthen those livelihoods. And just that asterisk at the bottom, it's not a project, but it's a, a theme that I'm very keen on um, as recognising that fish feeds are a real barrier to, to aquaculture development in the Pacific, or one of the barriers. And so we've got some pieces of work just scoping out what we could do in that space, reviewing what's been done in the past, drawing on those lessons learned, engaging with the feed companies and other stakeholders to understand where the opportunities are and where ACR might contribute to that space. And that's particularly one where in, in conversation with World Fish for that application in Timor. And that's it. I'm going to leave it at that, at that point. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.